Man, God is so good. sitting beside me, and I, I say this so you can pray for her. She was sitting beside me, and it was her first time to fly, which it was quite the uh, quite the adventure for her, and she kept grabbing my knee, and then she was embarrassed that she was grabbing my knee, and so I used that knee grab as an opportunity to share the gospel with this woman, and she said, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm just nervous. And I said, that's okay. And I felt like the Lord just had me give her a word. And as I was sitting there, I felt like the Lord told me to tell her, I don't make mistakes. I'm like, God, I, I don't, that doesn't make much sense. And he said, it doesn't have to make sense to you. So I looked at her and I said, I don't know you, but the Lord just told me to tell you that he doesn't make mistakes. And then as soon as I stepped down and said that, the Holy Spirit just started flowing. And I said, I can tell you something else, too. He loves you. He's pursuing you. And it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. He's after your spirit and after your heart. And he wants to redeem the messes that you made. And as soon as I said that, tears just started flowing down this woman's face. And she said, I'm just leaving Houston, and I'm a wreck. And I, you don't know how much I needed to hear that. And I just want us as a church to pray for this lady. Uh, you know, she never gave me her name, and that's okay. But just pray for her that God touches her. Because, man, just that look on her face of hopelessness. I believe that God can just heal that and just touch that part of her life. So come in in prayer with me, this woman. Open your Bibles. You can be opening. Uh, I'll tell you where in a minute. <laughs> Just open somewhere. Well, I'm sure I'll hit it. I'll hit that point at some time in the sermon. It's like a clock that the batteries have gone dead. You know, it's always right two times a day. So at some point, I'll find out where you are. I want to read words to you before I have you turn there. And I, I want you to guess who said these words. He is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and His dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders on heaven and in earth. Would anyone like to hear who said those words? Anybody want to take a guess who said those words? Who? David? No. Moses, Abraham, no. No, not John. No, it was Richie just now, but that's not who originally said it. <laughs> King Darius. That will never get that. Secular king of the Persians. I want to read those words again. This is a godless. This is not the nation of Israel. This is King Darius in the book of Daniel, chapter 6. I'm going to back up a couple verses. In verse 25 of chapter 6 of Daniel, it says, Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that all in my royal dominion people are to tremble and to fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion there shall be no end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. Wow. That brings that into a whole lot deeper meaning there for those to come from secular lips. Doesn't it? For a secular king, not a God follower before, for someone that is from a secular nation, not the nation of Israel, 
to utter those words, what do you call that? You call that a move of God. <laughs> you call it a move of God. You know, a lot of times we look at secularism in the world today and the culture, how it seems to be spiraling down. And we think that we're without hope. But the truth is, God is able to bring a revival about in this culture, just like He was about to bring a revival in that culture. Secular kings of the world, no matter what they do, they can still tremble under the power of God, and God can still get their attention. While I was on this trip, I was praying one day, and I said, Lord, what is it that you're wanting to do? What is it you're trying to do? And I felt like the Lord spoke to me. I want Christian fellowship to be a spark of a regional revival in western Kentucky. And I said, Lord, that's what I want. You know, Lord, bring that. We want that, Lord. Let us be a part of that. And I felt like as I prayed that, the Lord said, there's some things that we've got to take care of first. And the Lord brought me to Daniel. How do you get to that place where a secular king and people that are even leaders of secularism bow their knee and make a decree like that? Well, we have to travel back before we get there. So now turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. And I want to look at the beginning of this story. Praise the Lord. I can feel the presence of the Lord here today. This story begins in chapter 1, verse 1 of Daniel. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand and some of the vessels of the house of God. Now that's interesting that the story that began the secular king bowing his knee to the Lord began with Israel being besieged and taken into captivity. So Nebuchadnezzar comes and he takes, besieges Judah and he takes some of the royal vessels into captivity and he brought them to the land of Shinar, the house of his God, and he placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Not the God, but his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge and understanding and learning and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. Now they had a plan. They wanted the best, the brightest of the youth to bring them to this land and to acclimate them into this new culture. Does that sound familiar or what? I'm telling you, the world is still after our kids. They're still after a generation. They're still enticing them with the things of the world. But I can tell you here at 40 years old, this world has nothing for us. Nothing. There's nothing that this world has for us that's appealing, that's appetizing, that will do us any good. But they decided we want the best and we want to, the word I'm going to use is expose them to the land of the Chaldeans. We want them to see how we do things. We want them to be exposed to our way of doing things. See, there's some forms of parenting that says, you know what, we need to expose our kids. Let me tell you, I want to insulate my child as long as I possibly can from the things of this world. Well, you're not doing him any good. Yes, I am. I don't want him to have to experience those things. I don't want him to be indoctrinated into the world's way of doing things. I don't want him to see, well, that's just normal. Normal is doing it God's way. Normal is exposing him and giving him a hunger for the things of God, not exposing him, well, this is how the world says you're supposed to do it. But that's what they were doing. They were bringing the best. They wanted the best. Because if they could get the best, then it was easy to get everyone else. So they brought them to the land and they exposed them to this new culture. Let's continue. The king assigned them a daily portion of food that the king ate. So it wasn't just like McDonald's. It was like the best of the food. It wasn't Jack in the Box. 
<laughs> it's like a steak from Cynthia's. <laughs> it's like the good stuff that the king was eating himself. He, they gave him a portion of that. That the king ate and the wine that he drank. And they were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they would stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, you know them better as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them the names Daniel, he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah, he called Shadrach. Mishael, he called Meshach. And Azariah, he called Abednego. But here's where the plan of that secular king went awry. He didn't count on the integrity and the holiness of these people of God. Because this next verse defines everything in Daniel's life. But, remember they're taken into captivity and they want the best. They're going to expose them to their way of doing things so they can indoctrinate them into their way. But, they're going to give them the best of the king's food. The best that they have to offer. Because that's the world's way of doing things. They want to say that this is the best. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. He made a decision. I don't care what you're offering me. I don't care the peer pressure you're putting on me. I don't care how good you say this is. I won't defile myself and my God. What's missing in the world today? A backbone from people that won't compromise. Amen. See, that's where it all gets messed up. We make little bitty compromises. And then we find ourselves in a place that we never thought we'd be. And we justify those compromises. We make excuses of why this is okay for us. We, we go to long leaps to explain why this is okay. Why God understands. I mean, after all, it's reasonable, isn't it? They've been taken into captivity. They're not at home. They're not in their regular world. This is good food. I'm hungry. Not to mention, you know, they had the... The food laws, the ceremonially clean foods that Israelites were allowed to eat. And who knows if what the king was offering them was pork or, or something that they weren't allowed to have. But surely God would understand. He doesn't want me to starve to death. God, this is okay for me. But Daniel made a decision. I won't compromise my integrity and my holiness. See, this story begins with teenagers with a backbone. Let me tell you something today. That is still possible. Amen. It is still possible to not bow your knees to the secularization of this world. It's still possible to not bow your knee to the sin that everything that your friends are doing around you. It's still possible to stand and say, I won't defile myself. But let me tell you something. That doesn't come magically. It comes by making decisions that I won't compromise. Am I right? I know this sounds harsh, and that's not the way I'm... I kind of do mean it that way, actually. Compromising our integrity and our walk with the Lord is never okay. It's never justifiable. It's never excusable. And there's God all along wanting us to stand for Him. Oh, He'll understand. He doesn't care. This one decision doesn't matter. How hungry Daniel must have been when that food was placed before him. How hungry and starving he must have been after that long journey 
Let me tell you, that long plane ride last night, we got on the land, and I told Jenny, I'm hungry. <laughs> they get there, and he has to be starving. Oh, God, it doesn't matter. I don't care if it's ham. Give me ham. I'm starving. I could care less. It wasn't excusable. And he made a decision. I won't defile myself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. And therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink. He's going to see that you're in worse condition than you who are your own age. So you would endanger my head. In other words, I'm going to have my head chopped off because you won't eat this. Eat. And Daniel said, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Goodness. And let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you. And deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to him in this matter and he tested them for ten days. And at the end of ten days it was seen that they were in better appearance and fatter in flesh. These guys are getting fat off of vegetables. I don't know how that happens. I know how it happens again in other things. Not vegetables. So the steward took away the food and the wine that they were to drink, and he gave them vegetables. As for these youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So I want to talk very briefly this morning, but I want to kind of draw the picture of the way that the enemy works. And it starts with that first step that we're talking about, exposure. Say exposure. How do we live a life that moves us towards revival? Because we live in a secular world, do we not? I mean, God's called us to be in the world, but not of the world. Am I right? Exposure. Let me tell you what exposure leads to most of the time. It's that second step we're talking about. Exposure leads to compromise. Say compromise. It goes from exposure to compromise. See, if you're exposed to something, it's easy to compromise. How many people have been on a diet at some time in your life? I've been on 35,000 different kinds of diet. And in my weight, in my life, I have lost literally 100,000 pounds. 35, well done. Exposure. It's like you're doing good. You know, you've gotten up, you've eaten fruit for breakfast. Hallelujah. You've done good. You've had a healthy lunch. It was a salad with no dressing. I mean, none. Vegetables, you're eating, you're starving by about, you know, you're starving already, but it's about 2 o'clock and you're walking through, you're doing good. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And you walk by and on the counter is a bag of double-stuffed Oreos. Those are not of God. It's not just the regular ones. You know what I'm talking about. When they doubled that cream in there, they created something. And you're trying to do good. And all you've seen all day is vegetables and fruit. And you're doing good. You're drinking water. And it's your kids. It's Trace. He has a bag of double stuffed Oreos. And you walk by and you see it. And it's like a deer in a headlight. I've been exposed to the Oreo. And then you kind of walk by, you look, you shake your head. Maybe you put a dishcloth over it so you don't have to see it. And then you start thinking, oh, one just won't hurt. Will it? Man, will one Oreo hurt? It's not going to... I've done good. I've had... You start to justify, oh, I had fruit for breakfast. I had a dressingless salad for lunch. 
I have walked on my Fitbit. Look at this. 3,000 steps already. Praise the Lord. One Oreo. I deserve this. And you take it and you eat it the way you're supposed to. You twist it off and you lick the cream with your teeth. And, and you throw the cookie away. No, I'm kidding. You eat the cookie last. And you're sitting there and then you're like, oh, okay. And you go back in the living room and you thought, you know what? Another one sure would be good. Just, just one more. That first one, man, that was good. But I think the second one, it'll do it. And I'll tell you what, I'll eat the second one, but I won't eat anything the rest of the day. And that'll make up for it. You start justifying. It's like, has anybody ever been there? Or am I just like, oh, thank you, Jesus. There's others. And you go back in there. It's like, and you're kind of proud about it. You know what? It's okay, I'm not going to eat the rest of the day. And oh, this one you just inhale. You don't even have the time. Oh, okay. Oh. And then your mind starts wandering in a different direction. You know what? I've already ruined the diet today. <laughs> it's Sunday after all. Diets are supposed to start on Monday. I just forget it. And it's not long till you have Oreos lodged in this area right here because you're just like grab them and you've, before long you've inhaled the whole bag. And the diet has gone out the window. Let me tell you what process that took. You were exposed to something to lead you down the path you weren't supposed to be on. You made one compromise. <laughs> And then the third step from compromise, I'm now backslidden from my diet. See, a lot of us are in a backslidden condition and we don't even realize it. We were exposed, we compromised, and then compromise became such a way of life that we're no longer identified by what we were in the beginning and we're in a backslidden condition. <laughs> and we're actually walking a different direction. And now our goal is not to walk this way. We're just kind of living and existing. How does that happen? Small compromises. See, that decision Daniel made there was, I won't be defiled. I won't make one compromise because my integrity and my walk with the Lord is that important that one simple compromise, no matter the excuse, no matter the justification, I won't do it. Let me ask you, where is that kind of walk with the Lord in the world today? Lord, I won't compromise. I don't care what the world is offering me. It has nothing for me. I won't compromise and defile me or defile your name, Lord. Well, that seems a little radical, Richie. Let me tell you, that's the kind of walk he wants you to have. <laughs> and it's the kind of walk he wants me to have. Not that's just floating through life. Compromise and doing what we want to. There's a lot of us that are in a backslidden condition and we don't even realize it because we're still associated with the Lord. See, it starts with exposure. Then it goes to compromise, which leads us to backsliding. And the fourth step is the absolute worst. Now you're no longer identified. It's complete apostasy. See, if you read through the book of Daniel, what happens as you see the threesome, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there's this plan that they build these, what, golden idols? Is that what it is? They say, you're going to bow down and worship these. I'm like, we're not doing that. We will not do that. And the king says, oh, that's fine. We'll throw you into the fiery furnace then. That's fine. God can deliver us, but if he doesn't, we're still not going to do that. How can you stand in times like that? It's because you made a decision long ago that I won't compromise. I want to suggest something to you today you may disagree with. That's okay. I believe if they would have compromised in the beginning, 
right there with the little things, if they would have just compromised, I don't think they would have stood when the big test came. Because they were already accustomed to compromising, to a life of compromise. When Daniel, you remember they said, for 30 days you can't pray to anybody but the king, the God of the king. And Daniel said, that's fine. You can make whatever law you want to. And he goes home just like he's accustomed to doing with an open window. And he prays to the God of heaven. I think that if he would have made a decision in the beginning and would have compromised himself with the king's food, I think when it came time to that, he would have compromised that decision as well. See, because compromise leads to compromise leads to compromise, which leads to backsliding, which leads to complete apostasy away from the Lord. It starts with compromise. It actually starts with being exposed. That's why I believe the longer we can keep our kids from being exposed to the things of this world, the better off we are. That's just our form of parenting. You parent your child how you wish. Say compromise. compromise. Compromise comes from exposure. Compromise leads to backsliding, which leads to apostasy. And we know Daniel gets thrown in the lion's den, does he not? And we know the great story that happened afterwards. Man, the next day the king looks down there and Daniel's like, hey, how's it going? That's an interesting night that he had. Verse 19 of chapter 6. I know I'm jumping all over Daniel here. The king arose and went in haste to the den of the lions. And he came near to the den where Daniel was. And he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the mouth of the lions? And Daniel said to the king, O oh, king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me. Look at the next verse, or the next phrase, I guess, in the same verse. They've not harmed me. Why have they not harmed me? Because I was found blameless before him. Because I was found blameless before him. I know it's not by our works. I know our righteousness, like Ronnie said, I agree with that. It's filthy rags. I believe that. But there's something to be said for a blameless walk in front of the Lord. A life of holiness. A life of no compromise. Daniel makes a bold declaration. I trusted God, but he's delivered me because I was found blameless in front of my God. How many of us can say that today? Those are strong words, guys. I mean, I think about the just the levity. Not, not levity. The heaviness. I mean, just think about the weight, the gravity. You know? I was found blameless before God. So he delivered me. He was resting on something. I'm not going to defile myself with the king's portion. I don't care what the world is offering me. This could be the best that you're offering me. I won't defile myself with it. I'm not going to compromise. I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going to stand I'm going to stand. I'm going to follow him with all that I am. And come what may, I'm going to trust the Lord. And look what he did. He delivered me because I was found blameless. And that's when the king says, Oh God, he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. And his dominion, there will be no end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in the heaven and the earth. 
He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. Oh God, you are the true God and the, your kingdom there shall be no end. That's coming from the mouth of a secular king. Because long ago, a man had integrity, a youth had integrity, and made the decision of, I won't defile myself and compromise my walk with the Lord. And he walked that out. And God delivered him because of that decision. A king bows his knee to Almighty. Just like I said earlier, God wants this church to be the spark of a revival, a regional revival. But the heavy word that I want to bring to you today is some of us, all of us, maybe, I don't know, most of us have lived a life of compromise. And it's time to go back and get that right where we won't defile ourselves with what the world is offering. Because we can't walk that life of defiling ourselves and still expect to push people to Jesus. It's that life of, I won't defile myself. God, I'm sold out to you. And it made a difference in the world. See, but today, here's what we think. Well, we've got to be culturally relative. I've got to be like them so I can get into their world and maybe someday tell them about Jesus. Let me tell you what that is. That is the pathway to compromise most of the time. And it's an excuse we use to do what we want to do. <laughs> and we even say, well, I'm being missional. No, you're compromising your walk and your integrity. And it's time we backed up and sold out to Jesus and became the people that he's called us to be. Let me tell you something. The world will take notice of that. A secular king bows his knees and says, Oh God! Daniel didn't try to be culturally relative to Nebuchadnezzar, to Darius. He didn't say, Here, let me, let me sit down and eat some of this king's meat with you and let's talk. He said, No, I'm not going to defile myself with that junk. I'm going to live a life sold out to the Lord and you're about to see him work. Agree, disagree, it doesn't matter. That's the way that the Lord has showed me. <laughs> if we would go back, I know you're going to be exposed to things. I know I'm going to be exposed to things. It's time that Christians get a backbone and learn how to say, No! I won't defile myself with that. I won't walk down that path. That's not for me. I'm going to live a life of dedication and devotion. 100% sold out to Jesus. <laughs> Where is that kind of walk in the world today? Where is that kind of walk in me? In us? Then I want to be sold out. Small compromises. One twist of an Oreo. And then you can't fit in your Sunday morning britches the next thing you know. One compromise. That's where it leads. One compromise to the next justification of another compromise to the next excuse of I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do... And then we're not even... Following him anymore, we're totally backslidden. One compromise. He delivered me because I walked blameless before him. That's why he delivered me. Father, I delivered the word you told me to deliver, and I hope I did it in love, Lord, because that's the heart it came from. Lord, my heart for us today. Lord, it is to be a people that point to the greatness of our God, just like Daniel. But Lord, you've told me personally, I've made compromises in my life that I shouldn't have made. Lord, I know that there's many others, Lord. Lord, that we've tasted the king's need. We've excused it, Lord, decisions that we knew was wrong when we did it. 
forgive us, Lord. Lord, and I pray right now that not condemnation, Lord, that's not what you're in the business of, but that the conviction of the Holy Spirit would fall in this house today. In the name of Jesus, convict our hearts, Lord. Lord, I can't do your job. I don't even want to, Lord. Lord, move in our hearts now, Lord. Lord, I've been as obedient as I know how to be, God. You want to use this church as a spark of a regional revival, Lord. You've spoken to me, Lord. But, Lord, you also told me we got to get some things straight first. we got to write some compromises, Lord, because it's not too late to go back. every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask a difficult question. And I'm going to ask for you to boldly respond, not to me, 